the Northwest Alps, the birthplace of nap tectonics, ideas that revolutionized understanding of mountain belt geology. And we're off to visit a particularly key tectonic contact, which carries rocks that form this famous peak in Italy called Monte Cervino, but is perhaps better known by its Swiss name, the Matterhorn. It's a focal point in understanding alpine tectonics. Its crustal roots reflect orogenesis, but it forms a small erosional remnant, part of crust that overrode, forming a lid, a nap, that capped the Alps. It's an idea that could be traced back to the Italian geologist Felice Giordano in the 1860s, not long after the mountain's first ascent. But formal ideas of nap tectonics had to wait until Emil Argonde in the early 20th century. He interpreted the Alps as formed by collision of the Italian promontory with the rest of Europe, a promontory that formed part of Africa, or Gondwana. And seeing through this late bulge, the Italian crust in yellow is shown by being driven to the left over stacked European crust. That remnant, a tectonic clipper, the Dom Blanche Nap, with the Matterhorn on its right, eastern side. So the rock should show evidence for this tectonic transport. And that's what we're off to investigate. So we're off to those snow patches over there. But while we're here, we can set the scene the low outcrops going down into the valley, they're beige, calcious, they're oceanic sediments. We'll look at those on our way down. Up in the clouds there, going up to the skyline, well, that's the so-called Dent Blanche Clipper, a piece of Gondwana, essentially part of the upper plate that's come over the European plate. So it should be moving or record having moved essentially towards the west or north. Well, we're going to go over there and see if the structures in outcrop bear that prediction out. So a quick diversion into structural geology to explain tectonic kinematics. We want to deduce the tectonic transport directions and senses of movement. Now, on faults, these can be determined by offset markers like this. But deeper in the crust, the same structures are represented by shear zones, where rocks smear out, ductile, not brittle deformation. Zooming in, shear zones are exemplified by planar foliations, the smearing, and the rocks can be very platy and elliptical markers get increasingly strung out, creating linear features on the foliation. So shear zone rocks can be very flaggy, like this, as the minerals flatten and align. And on this flagginess, the foliation, mineral grains are streaked out and aligned, forming a tectonic lineation. And this betrays the relative movement axis in the shear zone. But we also need to determine the sense of shearing. And this needs to be defined by looking side on. So we will use small scale structures in the rock to identify and interpret the asymmetry, the sense of shear and the kinematics of the shear zone. That's what we're off to find over on the Matterhorn. Getting there involves crossing ground that a few decades ago was covered by glacier. And now we just have to scrape across all this debris they've left behind. Okay, well let's bypass the refugio, continue up the hill into the Don Blanche Clipper. From the refugio, a path leads up, crossing the tectonic boundary at the top of the rocks 
of the former ocean and then crosses into the Dom Blanche Clipper, transported continental crust. So before we go and look at the rocks, this is first a bit of a pilgrimage to the memorial to Jean-Antoine Carrel, the Alpine guide who died here in 1891. Carroll was involved in the competition to be the first to climb the Matterhorn, beaten to it by Edward Wimper in 1865. Carol and party summited three days later from this Italian side and he continued to guide groups up the Matterhorn. While guiding in 1891 up on the mountain a major storm blew up and he died here exhausted having successfully brought his clients down to the easier ground. And this simple cross marks the place where he died. OK, back to the rocks. And although the Dom Blanche Clipper is all continental crust from Gondwana, it has diverse geology, carried on that tectonic contact. We're not heading far into it, but far enough to see a couple of rock units. So let's go and have a look. Well, these nice coarse grained rocks are actually gavros. They've got this really great coarse texture. And it's easy to get confused here because you might think these are part of the oceanic crust that lies beneath the Dom Blanche Clipper, but actually they're within the Clipper. These are Permian aged rocks and part of the history of crustal formation late in the history of the Gondwanan continent. So essentially upper plate. And they've got this really nice spaced shear zone fabric running through, which we can take a look at. The dark minerals, now amphiboles, streaked out and the plagioclase is forming this really nice deformation fabric. And these fabrics are alpine. But to see them better developed, so we're going to come away from the gabbros and drop and look into the material into which the gabbros were emplaced. Continental crust that's much more highly sheared. And let's see if we can pick out some kinematics in that material. On the edge of the gabbro, we can see these intrusive stringers now sheared into the surrounding gneisses. This stuff. So coming down from the gabbros, we encounter these really platy rocks. So let's take a closer look. So here's the foliation, and there's a really intense stretch in the ocean right across here. So I'm just going to measure that. Off like that, something like that, which is plunging down towards the northwest. So Marlonites, lots of shearing on a northwest southeast axis. But which way did it go? Is it top to the northwest? Top to the southeast? We need to look at a face this way to find that information out. Let's go and find one over here. So here's a really useful face that is oriented like this and our stretching lineations we've just seen on the foliation is running off in this direction. So we're looking side on to the lineation. And this is the main foliation going on in here. And you can see that it's spaced 
and in the so-called microlithons, the bits, the widths of my finger that lie between the foliation in here, we can trace little veinlets that are streaked out systematically in this sense. This is a late vein, so don't worry about that, it late and cross cuts the fabric. It's this leucosome, and that implies quite clearly a top that way sense of movement. So taking this at face value implies a sheer sense of top to the southeast. Hmm. Interesting. But it's always unwise to simply build an idea up from one outcrop, one example of sheer criteria. So let's see if we can reproduce that interpretation on other outcrops further down the track. Well, let's see what's to be seen in this rather shady face here. But actually, it's quite difficult interpreting unambiguously the sense of shear in these rocks. This is another face that um, is essentially looking side on to the stretching lineation. And you can see this sort of aplytic vein folded like this. So there's a sense of vergence which implies a sort of shear that way. But actually, the other way you can interpret this is to say that these short limbs are low deformation and the sense of shear is deflecting the vein with top that way. And you can see these other shears doing the same thing. So perhaps these nices are better interpreted as a set of flattening structures like this, within which there's no overall sense of asymmetry, but thinning of this lower part of the Dom Blanche nap. So, difficult to get sheer criteria from the Dom Blanche clipper, at least from here. Well, let's continue down, to see what else we can find lower in our transect. Still, really platy rocks. Come down 100 metres, a really thick shear zone. With a really strong lineation. Actually, it's almost like a rodding lineation here. Well, I've come down across the base of the Don Blanche Clipper down to these green stones. And these are oceanic metabasalts. And I know that because just around the corner, they're intercalated with oceanic metasediments. Let's go and check them out. So these are the green stones, and these base rocks, calcious, metalimestones, oceanic metasediments. Really spectacular. So let's see if we can find some uh, kinematic indicators. So up here on the flat top, we've got a chance of looking down on the main schistosity, the foliation. And here we can find stretch lineation going down like this. So that's west northwest, east southeast, west northwest, east southeast. So a good stretching lineation in the metabasic component. Okay, well let's see if we can find some shear criteria on a face in this orientation. And here's a face 
just here in a perfect orientation. So, west northwest, east southeast. Let's have a look for some shear criteria. Well, these are little features called shear bands, and they clearly imply a top to the right sense of shear. And that is towards the east southeast. So, these highly sheared metabasics, the Oceanic metal sediments directly under the Don Blanche Clipper are being sheared top east southeast. Okay, well, let's continue down and we can summarize. Passing these nice folds in deformed metabasalts, axial surfaces like this, recumbent which could imply simply that these units have been flattened. So rather like the clipper above. The rocks of the Oceanic series below the clipper show really strong stretching lineations and pretty much ubiquitous top to the east-southeast or southeast shear senses. We can have a look at uh, some work that I did with colleagues a long time ago now uh, and add some further information, further kinematic information for this transect on a profile. So actually the Don Blanche continental crust and the oceanic units are folded together but sheared on a northwest southeast axis. Lots of shearing that's dominantly top to the southeast but with evidence for extensive flattening or thinning. This shear zone that separates the two distinct units seems to be moving top to the east-southeast. Now, when we started the day, we forecast that this contact should be going top to the northwest, as essentially Gondwana or Africa or the Don Blanche nap, if you like, has been carried over the oceanic units towards Europe. But actually, we've seen the opposite's true. The shear sense is that way towards the east or east southeast, southeast, certainly away from Europe. So if that's Gondwana, it looks like it's moving back to Gondwana, or another way of putting it, the oceanic rocks beneath are being moved out to the west relative to the Matterhorn, the Don Blanche Clipper. Let's see how that might work. These diagrams aren't as elegant as Argon's and others, but they make the point. Oceanic series subducted, caught in the vice between the two colliding continents, and they squirted up the subduction zone, perhaps driven by buoyancy. The zone at depth has been flattened with shearing. This is called channel flow, and the top surface of the channel shows apparent top to the right, down dip, shear senses, just as we've found. As the collision continues, underlying crust or shortening elevates the channel and erosion exposes it. So understanding the Alps isn't just about describing the final geometry of naps as found in generations of textbooks. But if we're to test evolutionary models like this one, we need the kinematics too. Now, evidence has been collected for several decades by many, many structural geologists, but it's still rather underused in regional syntheses and descriptions of the Alpine chain. And as we'll see later, this type of evidence is critical for understanding the tectonic processes that exhumed once deeply buried metamorphic rocks. But that's for another time. For now, let's get back down to the valley. Thank you for watching this exploration of the tectonic contact at the foot of the Matterhorn.